Okay, so last speaker will be Dr. John Eastman from UC Davis, Sacramento. He'll be talking to us about the management principles of concurrent combined pelvic ring injuries and acetabular fractures. John. Thanks, Diaz. Uh, and we'll try to wrap up today's session uh, with this. And I think it's a very daunting task just because I've just seen the, the amount of details that's going within each um, topic within pelvic ring and acetabular fractures. Now we're gonna try to combine them uh, into to both injuries at the same time. And so I wanna start with our patient here that we'll come back to at the end. And I'm just gonna tell you, he has a left-sided transverse posterior wall, uh, a juxtatectal or a truxtatectal, maybe transverse at the, at the very peripheral margin, but then a complete symphysis pubis and then a right-sided sacroiliac joint injury. And so just take 20, 30 seconds and think about how we're going to get a, a reduction for each of these injuries. Uh, what's the sequence in terms of which injury is going to be addressed first? And what are the possibilities or problems with doing one versus the other uh, before each one? And so we just start posteriorly, start with the symphysis, start with the acetabulum. Are you prone? Are you supine? I think a lot of different ways to, to start addressing this patient. Um, and so we're going to get into them. And so objectives, I just want to, to briefly cover and just hit home the point of the variety of the injuries that are out there and really the importance of, of understanding each injury uh, and why that comes into play. And then just to begin to, uh, to recognize the potential treatment strategies and, and why uh, we may pick one versus the other. Um, and so I think just like everything in life, the spectrum of injuries is there. And here's two extremes. The left is a a very minimally displaced uh, transverse with an ipsilateral uh, sacral leg joint. Um, and then uh, obviously on the right, you can see a more impressive uh, complete pelvic ring disruption with a, a symphysis and a transverse and a sacral leg joint as well. And so again, those are gonna be treated as entirely two different um, uh, injuries. You can see the resultant reconstructions. And so again, opposite ends of the spectrum uh, with much different treatment strategies. And so I think the, the, the main problem is that when everyone thinks about these, they want the, the direct way of how to deal with it every single time. And the truth is we don't have that, that Bible or that manual. We don't have a, an algorithm that's applicable to every single injury. Um, and the literature that we can see, if we do a PubMed search, you can see it here, uh, is that there's uh, you know 40 or so results pop up, but really um, uh, the ones that come into play that really take a look into them are listed here. Uh, but even then it's challenging because you can see the variety of these injuries that come into play. And so it really makes um, uh, doing meaningful research that has comparing apples to apples is incredibly difficult. And so what we take from those studies is that the incidence of these injuries is fairly low, you know, anywhere from five to 50%. Um, the pelvic ring component is uh, about the same in terms of anterior posterior injuries versus lateral compression injuries. Uh, in terms of acetabular fractures, we can see that the transverse, the T-shape, and the associated both column are all fairly common, uh, and the posterior wall tends to be not as common. And why that is, is maybe towards the, the pathomechanics, uh, which in and of itself is not so clearly understood. Um, but you can see there's some sort of typical lateral injury vector in terms of the acetabulum, but also some sort of external rotation force uh, of the pelvic ring. I think ultimately all these fall into some sort of a combined mechanism um, to try to explain how these occur. Uh, but we do know that they occur from a high energy mechanism for most of these patients. And so uh, accompanying with that, you're gonna see patients with a higher ISS score uh, that goes along with increased early transfusion rates and a, a lower systolic blood pressure when they present to the emergency department. And that comes into play in terms of resuscitation, but. Uh, ultimately thinking about timing for these patients and how that's going to dictate uh, when you can start their treatment, uh, what positions they may or may not tolerate, and then the surgical approach. Uh, we just heard uh, again from Dr. Stover why this may come into play in, in terms of when you have to do or escalate to a different surgical approach. And so uh, defining and understanding the injury, I think, uh, again, like everything we've talked about so far in this course, this is incredibly important. And so each, uh, each of us, I think, has our own way of um, systematically going over each image, uh, starting with radiographs, uh, going through the axial and reconstructions on the CT, uh, and finally with the 3D reconstructions. Um, and I, 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 I ask everyone to develop their own to make sure they're not gonna miss any sort of those details. 
I will say it's easy to focus on the acetabular fracture itself, just because uh, I think we all recognize that takes precedence in some of these injuries. Uh, but uh, don't uh, overlook any sort of the subtle injuries that we can often find. Uh, and I think Dr. Adams in his, the first lecture of this course gave a, a good look at uh, evaluating the pelvic ring. And you can see here, don't uh, overlook the subtle injuries. And so here's a patient with a femoral neck, a left anterior column, and a left-sided sacral joint that's very apparent on his injury AP pelvis on the left. But in a quick study of his CT, uh, you can see that he has some subtle air densities there on the right. Um, and again, as that patient goes to the OR, he can see his right-sided sacral joint is clearly unstable. And so again, that's been described in terms of uh, uh, being uh, reduced either in a sheet or a binder or also uh, within the CT scanner itself. And so looking for these subtle injuries will, come in a, uh, will be important in terms of sequencing, um, and we'll see that shortly. Very similarly, uh, I think the contralateral sacral joint sometimes with a pelvic ring injury can also be overlooked. Um, and here's a, a patient with an LC1 variant injury that we can see with a right side of the sacral fracture, and then some contralateral rami fractures anteriorly. But again, a, a thorough study of the CT will just show a couple of cuts uh, with uh, a small avulsion fracture seen there on the left, but really no evidence of uh, instability there. But uh, with uh, placement of uh, a transsacral style screw, you can see that the joint gets pushed off. And again, this is uh, described recently by Dr. Moffrey and all. Um, showing roughly about a 10% incidence of these uh, in, in polytraumatized patients. And so, again, we'll see that these comes into play in terms of uh, the summation of malreductions phenomenon that we can uh, appreciate as it terms to, to building back the entire pelvic ring. And so, again, that has to be dealt with appropriately. But getting into potential combinations of what we can have, we can have any sort of acetabular fracture with either an isolated anterior pelvic ring injury, an isolated posterior pelvic ring injury, and then again, an anterior and a posterior pelvic ring injury. Um, and we'll go through examples of each of these. And I think uh, starting to talk about reconstruction, uh, I think classically the golden rule by Letronel was to always begin the reconstruction posteriorly. And just like the associate of both column, the reason was that you're gonna have a, a stable base to build back to. And so if you recreate the posterior aspect of the posterior pelvic ring, you now have something stable to anatomically reduce uh, both the acetabulum and then the anterior pelvic ring uh, back into space appropriately. The problem is though that reduction has to be anatomic. And so if anything uh, is off in terms of the reduction posteriorly, as you work more uh, progressively forward, that malreduction uh, gets exaggerated uh, to the point where it will be unacceptable. And so uh, when the posterior pelvic ring is off and there's no other anterior pelvic ring injury, there's no other source of mobility. And so the acetabulum being in the middle is gonna uh, suffer the consequence of that. And a great example here, we can see uh, a transtectal uh, transverse posterior wall with an ipsilateral sacral leg joint injury as demonstrated by these select cuts. And you can see here's the uh, post drop of AP pelvis. Uh, but what you can see is that, again, there's uh, uh, incongruities, uh, both of the sacral -like joint and then the symphysis. But if you look closely there, you can see a residual gap in the, the transtectal component of the T, or sorry, of the transverse. And so the postoperative CT scan shows that. So the incomplete uh, reduction of the sacral -like joint um, forces that in the summation of malreduction concept so that the acetabulum cannot move in space. And so it's left with a gap. And so understanding these injuries is going to uh, be the, the key mark of this. And so I would uh, advocate for really considering each injury uh, separately and to understand it in detail. And once you have that detailed understanding, you're going to be able to decide what's the appropriate operative approach for either both uh, through a single incision or a, sing a surgical approach, which is ideal. Uh, but again, it may be nece necessary for a, a stage or a sequential approach. But again, I think the concept that everyone does agree with is that the acetabular reduction does take precedence. And so um, I think it's a little bit of a heresy to talk about form fractures in this setting, but I do think of the, the point is that it's not always done the same way, just like form fractures aren't. It's not always fix the radius first or always fix the ulna first. I think you take into consideration the injury details of each, and that's gonna tell you which one to start with and why because you will get uh, uh, ligament ataxis and it'll help your further reductions. But again, if you uh, have a malreduction of one, you're almost guaranteed to have a malreduction of the other. And so going through our injuries, um, we're gonna see just four uh, brief examples of some combined uh, injuries that we can see here. 
and the anterior pelvic ring component, uh, it can be ipsilateral, it can be contralateral, but oftentimes that's kind of an afterthought in terms of the reconstruction. And sometimes it will be addressed if there's residual instability in terms of the pelvic ring component, much like we do with the pelvic ring injury it's in isolation. Um, but rarely is that uh, addressed as a first component uh, to set up uh, some sort of ligament ataxis or indirect reduction of the acetabular fracture. And so uh, sometimes they are addressed uh, as a last component uh, or sometimes left uh, alone without any reduction or fixation uh, as they'll get an indirect reduction from the, uh, rest, uh, the complete restoration of the pelvic ring itself, but rarely is it first. The posterior pelvic ring injury, uh, we've uh, seen some examples. Um, here's a 23-year-old uh, with a uh, left-sided uh, associated both colon and mass tablet fracture, and then a, a left-sided sacral fracture that we can see here, uh, just uh, well, one select cut. But here, uh, in terms of uh, considering stage to, uh, or uh, which injury to, to, to think about first, I think in, in assessing this patient's overall pelvic ring uh, and acetabular injury, her overall pelvic ring alignment was uh, relatively maintained. And so uh, starting posteriorly first works here uh, in terms of in situ stabilization of the posterior pelvic ring and the sacral fracture. That way, we will have an intact ilium with stabilization of the ilium onto the sacrum uh, back to the axial skeleton. And therefore, once that's uh, uh, stabilized sufficiently uh, with multiple points of fixation, we now have an intact ilium uh, to begin the reconstruction that we uh, heard from, from Dr. Mayo. And so here, just select cuts uh, working through an iliungonal. Um, and here's this patient's uh, final post-operative imaging uh, we can see here with an acceptable result in terms of restoration of the pelvic ring uh, and the acetabular fracture with safe implants uh, and I think an acceptable reduction. And so another example uh, of uh, associated both column, uh, this time uh, with the left-sided sacral leg joint injury that's uh, fairly apparent there on the injury films. Uh, this time, uh, again, we can appreciate the, the subtleties of everything we're looking for uh, in terms of the articular injury. And here shown with the 3D surface rendered images. Um, but here, we're going to be doing uh, uh, most likely a, a formal ilioinguinal. And so through that lateral window, we're going to have an open approach uh, to that posterior pelvic ring. Uh, and so again, restoring our intact ilium to give us a base to build back to uh, will give us uh, a platform to begin the successful restoration of her acetabular fracture. And so here, uh, through the lateral window, uh, we can do a screw-based reduction, uh, direct reduction of the posterior pelvic ring. Uh, that, uh, uh, sets up uh, a formal ilinguinal uh, back into a stable base, and again, uh, clamp out the patient with uh, shans pins and K-wires to restore uh, each segment back into position, and then final radiograph show restoration of her fracture. With again, safe implants uh, and an acceptable reduction. And then lastly, I, I think these are the ones that uh, give a lot of us the most uh, concern because there really, uh, again, is no uh, way to deal with it each and every time. And I think the most controversy comes here. Uh, and I love hearing different thoughts because uh, uh, there really sometimes is no uh, correct way or one way to do it. And you can achieve this uh, in multiple uh, different methods. But this is our patient again. And so, again, it's uh, three different sites of injury uh, with the left uh, transverse posterior wall. Uh, the symphysis pubis, and then the contralateral sacral leg joint. And so he's, um, he's a, a rather large human. He's about 6'8", 300 pounds, and he laid down his motorcycle into a field. And so he has a bunch of abrasions onto his right side. And so it, it kind of steered our, our path in terms of maybe not considering doing uh, uh, or trying to avoid an open approach uh, as much as we could on the right side. And so for him, we started... Uh, thinking about his uh, acetabular fracture is the, the more important injury if we could stay away from his right-sided sacral leg joint. Uh, again, which you can see here. And just some select cuts. And so we started with an anterior approach uh, through uh, the an anterior intrapelvic as well as the middle window of uh, a formal iliunguinal. And you can see here a reduction of fixation of the acetabular fracture occurred first uh, with uh, direct manipulation and the modified reduction clamp with initial K-wire fixation, uh, followed by an integrated anterior column screw, and then an intrapelvic buttress to set up the initial reduction fixation of the transverse. Um, now, with his displaced uh, pelvic ring, I didn't want to really put a lot of uh, direct 
uh, pressure through the symphysis. And so I opted for taking the bilateral AIIS shan spins that you can see here to facilitate reduction of the pelvic ring. And so here you can see uh, both uh, the external fixator frame uh, reduction, uh, seeing the amount of torque that was needed to reduce the SI joint, and then direct reduction of the symphysis with just some fine tuning uh, with some screw based clamps. And that's our initial reduction you can see there, uh, followed by uh, plate uh, stabilization anteriorly, and then subsequent uh, posterior pelvic ring percutaneous fixation uh, for a sacral leg joint uh, demonstrated here. And then because of the, the posterior wall component, he did get a stage coca uh, but here's his final post chopper films. Again, with restoration of his global pelvic ring, uh, and then I think, uh, again, safe implants and an acceptable acetabular fracture reduction in all parts. And so I think, uh, again, we, uh, we've seen a lot of examples and just uh, to briefly demonstrate the wide range of injuries that exist, I think the, the key is to really understand each injury um, as, a, as a separate entity. And then once you have that detailed understanding, you can um, conceptualize and come up with an individual treatment plan for that patient. Um, I think always starting to consider posteriorly uh, is appropriate, uh, really in that if that injury is not uh, anatomically reduced, you're gonna potentially have a, a summation of malreductions. And so uh, again, we're always striving for an anatomic reduction with the acetabular fracture taking precedence, uh, but uh, uh, starting with the injury you can make perfect uh, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thanks, John, that's excellent.